All right, this is characteristics of dry friction. So friction is a force that resists the movement of two contacting surfaces that slide relative to one another. And friction will always act tangent. To the surface, as the point of contacts, as the points of contact. is directed so as to oppose the possible or the existing motion. So let's look at a free body diagram of that. We had some kind of crate with a weight W, and we were pulling with a force P. We would have a normal force we'll call this delta N, and then we would have a frictional force, delta Fn opposing the motion. And if we were to look at this really closely, the surface is not going to be perfectly even. Maybe it looks something like this. And we would have at each of these points of contact, we would have our delta N1 and our delta F1, which this resultant would give us delta R1, and that would be at every single surface. So over here we'd have delta F3, delta N3, and then the resultant of these two, delta R3. And I just skipped two because it's hard to draw in between there. So if we were to look this on a macro scale without looking at the deltas anymore, we would have the weight, we would have P at some height H, and then down here at point O, we would have our normal force acting, and this distance from the center to point O would be considered X, and then we would have our frictional force acting right here. Excuse me. And if we were to sum the moments about point O, we would have um, negative pH plus Wx equal to zero. When we solve that out, we would get that x is equal to pH over W. Oops, pH over W. So that's how you can determine the x such that it doesn't tip when you pull at P. So let's talk about impending motion. So if you were to pull right here, your P is slowly increased.
and then your frictional force also increases. until it attains a certain maximum. Fs, which is called the limiting static frictional force. which is equal to Fs mu s times n, where mu s is equal to the coefficient of static friction. And n, of course, is our normal force. So what this means is that P is slowly increased, and then F is going to increase up to its maximum value, which is Fs. So as you're pulling at P, you're going to have a frictional force that opposes said pull. But as soon as you get P to the point where it basically overcomes the frictional force, that's your minimum P needed to uh, cause it to start moving, or just about to cause it to start moving. And so that's why it means impending motion, because you're just about to move it, because you've completely opposed your frictional force. So if we were to draw a free body diagram, we had our weight, our P, then we've got N, and then FS. And this resultant of the normal and Fs is going to have this angle phi s. And phi s is called the angle of static friction. And that's going to be equal to the inverse tangent of Fs over N, which is also equal to tangent, right? Fs over N. Fs is equal to mu s times N divided by N, which is just equal to the inverse tangent of mu s. And there's your angle of static friction and how you can find it. So this mu s that coefficient of static friction. There's um, a table listed in your book that has some common ones, but you really have to know it based on the problem, or in real life, you basically need to experiment to figure out what that coefficient of static friction is, because that material can vary so much. Um, for instance, aluminum on aluminum can have a coefficient of static friction of 1.1 to 1.7, which is quite a range. So in reality you have to um, do an experiment to determine what your exact metal on metal or metal on wood, water on wood, whatever it is. Um, well, like, this is dry friction so no water, but whatever your two surfaces are you need to do an experiment to figure it out. So motion. So we just talked about motion and in doing so we talked about static um, friction. So now we're talking about once you've already got it moving. So that's if your P is bigger than your static friction. So you've already gotten it to move. So once you've gotten it to move, the frictional force at 
that, the contacting surface will drop to a smaller value, Fk. And Fk is your kinetic frictional force, kinetic being it's already in motion. And just like static friction, Fk is equal to mu k times n. But in this case, mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. And mu k is usually about 25% smaller than mu s. And you can also have an angle of kinetic friction, just like static, oops, which is equal to the angle of kinetic friction. And in this case, that's going to be equal to the inverse tangent of your coefficient of kinetic friction. And like I said, your angle, just like your um, mu s is greater than mu k, your angle of static friction is going to be greater than your angle of kinetic friction. So let's look at a little graph. Okay, so if I were to start right here at zero, and I were to increase p, increase p, and this would be fk, so that would be our kinetic friction force, this would be our static friction force. So I would just go up, 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 and then boom, right at the, as soon as you hit, or just right after you hit, the frictional, the static frictional force, you start moving, right? So then once, once you hit there, then your P can actually drop to just oppose the FS. So from this area, as your P is increasing, there's no motion. But then just as soon as you are able to exceed the, frictional, the static friction, then you have motion. And at that point, your P can decrease um, because your, well, your P can decrease, but in this case, we're still going up, 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 but your frictional force has decreased because now that you're moving, there's no more static friction, there's a kinetic friction. And that's it.